One of the greatest jazz musicians of all time, Milt Jackson, had a storied career that spanned from the 1940s up until his passing in 1999. Today we are going to take a very close look at one of his earliest solos from the 1947 record called Dorothy with trumpeter Howard McGee. Milt Jackson played an incredible solo over this tune. In fact, it's the second half of a rhythm changes chord progression, so it's only 16 measures long. But as you will see, those 16 bars contain so much information that we will be able to devise a number of really useful practice etudes and things that will really help your playing. The number one question I get from students and people that I know and also that I have for myself is how to actually learn something from transcription that comes out in your own playing. And I think that these exercises that I'll show you today can help you with that. So please stick around. So first thing we're gonna do is listen to the solo, then I will play it for you slowly on the vibraphone. I will explain each phrase, we'll talk about the harmony, and then I'll show you a bunch of exercises that I devised after practicing this solo for a while. Oh, it's such a great track. I highly recommend listening to the entire thing. But let's go to the vibraphone and I will play through that slowly for you. Okay, so the very first four bars of this solo are a 2-5-1 going to G7. However, the 2-5 is from G minor and the 1 is G dominant. So the first two measures actually use the G harmonic minor scale. And then the second two measures use the G mixolydian scale. And so the very first phrase starts on the high E flat and then goes down the G harmonic minor scale all the way until it gets to the D. And then right here he switches to G mixolydian. And of course we have this chromatic approach to the third. Okay. The next four bars, we have C7 sharp 11 for two bars, which makes it C Lydian dominant. And then we have C minor seven and F7 in bars three and four. Milt Jackson on the first two bars, he plays the following phrase. So that is on the C7 sharp 11 chord. And you see that at the beginning, he plays this passing tone from F to G. And from then on, it's all straight up from the G melodic minor scale. In fact, he plays the G melodic minor scale. G melodic minor, of course, is where the C Lydian dominant scale comes from. That's the parent scale. So this riff, once again. And then in bar uh, seven of the form on the C minor seven, he plays so actually, he sort of outlines a D minor triad first before getting to the C, what I call, even though he doesn't play the C, he plays... It looks like an E flat major 7 shape. Really, it functions like a C minor 9. And he's just playing this arpeggio before he plays this one. 
And then, in that measure, when the chord is F7, this is very interesting. He plays the following phrase. One, two, three, four, one. And what this outline is on the top, I see this as being a C half diminished seventh chord, right? That would be root position. This is third inversion. And if you put that over an F, it has the effect of being an F7 flat 9 sus. And Milt Jackson uses that sound quite a bit in his playing, uh, not just on this solo, but in many of his solos. So that whole line again. Okay, then we get to the fun part, this double time line. Let me play the whole thing for you in pieces because this is gonna play a factor in how I practiced it later on. So the very first measure is split between B flat major seven and G seven. And so the B flat major seven, Mill Jackson actually plays the following two beats worth of notes. So you see he actually starts on the third of the B flat major, right? We have, there's our triad, and he goes chromatically to the fifth and keeps going in fact, outlining a C minor triad with a chromatic approach to the fifth. And then he again lands on the fifth on the downbeat of beat three. So those two first two beats go like this. And then on beats three and four, now the chord, as soon as he hits this note, the chord is now a G7. And at that point he plays this. So the chord being, and once you hit that B flat, the chord changes to C minor seven. So this phrase is interesting. It's basically the top half of a G seven flat nine flat 13, which would be the same thing as C harmonic minor, but on G. The reason that is the main scale on a dominant seventh chord built on the G there is because we're still in the key of B flat. And this has many common notes to the B flat scale, right? That's the only change actually within that first fifth. So the line that Milt Jackson plays goes like this. And I think of that A actually as an approach tone to the C minor seven chord. So anyway, that line once again goes like this. notes. Now, in the second measure of this whole run, the chord now is a C minor 7, but this is the phrase that we get. So, the first two beats, that all occurs on the C minor 7. There's a couple of ways that you could analyze this, um, and I don't know which one is the correct way, because... Technically, that's an E flat seven uh, chord in third inversion, right? But then immediately after that, we get, which is outlining the F seven chord, I would say, going from third to the root. There's another way you could look at it because Milt Jackson would also play lines that would very honest, that would very often outline the sharp three diminished, which is, which is that, right? So the sharp, here's one, here's two, sorry, the sharp two diminished, not the sharp, sharp three. One, two, sharp two diminished chord that resolves upward to the um, first inversion of the one chord. You could look at it like that. You could think of it as an E7. You could also think of it as if it's a C7 with a flat nine, sharp nine, that's maybe a little bit too, too um, I don't know, a little bit too modern of a way to analyze it. But at any rate, it's a great line and it fits really well in this chord. So we have. Then on the downbeat of beat three, we have the F7 and Milt plays very standard bebop stuff here. So 
essentially, if you look at the notes that occur on the strong beat, we have beat. So it's basically going 5 3 1 on the B flat major triad. We have a surround tone, and then it goes back up to the F, and then we have another surround tone to the root. So if we look for that, that's actually an F triad. But I don't think he's thinking of an F triad there, I think he's thinking of approach notes approach tones, or enclosures as they are sometimes called. Let me play that whole line again. Okay, then, then the 1-6-2-5 continues. There, the C minor seven to F seven, and Milt obviously is altering. He's altering the F seven chord. It actually outlines an F sharp minor triad if you think about it, with the with the two in there, five, three, two, one, and F sharp minor. Of course, F sharp melodic minor is where the F seven altered dominant scale comes from, which is this. So. I mean, that is a classic Milt Jackson riff. You will hear that in almost, I would say, 80% of his solos from then on the rest of his life. He played some version of that phrase in it, and it's a beautiful phrase, so I highly recommend trying to lift it. Let's see, in the next measure, the B flat seven, we have, uh, actually, in the chord chart to most rhythm changes, in that bar, you'd have B flat, B flat seven, and then B flat seven over D on the second half of the bar. But Milt, of course, is not unlike many other beboppers in that he converts that B flat dominant seventh chord first into its relative two chord. So it's actually F minor seven, then B flat seven. So he outlines an F minor nine chord, right? Actually, he goes all the way up to the 11th and then to the flat 13 on the B flat seven. So F minor seven. That's essentially a 2-5-1 going to E flat. And then he sort of repeats a similar version of that phrase. Going up an E flat major 7, and then chromatically down, using that as an upper neighbor, lower neighbor, to target the root on the C minor 7 chord. This is actually the root of B flat major, but the chord there is C minor 7. Let me play the last four bars for you. One, two, three, four, one. And the last two bars, I would say, he's thinking basically about the deep B flat, either mixolydian or blues or some version of B flat. So he's kind of outlining, we have the root, the seventh, the fifth, and then he plays the four to three suspension. And of course, always the third has the great note, grace note below it. This shape right here, to me, that's actually kind of an E flat minor triad, and he's playing it over the F7, and again, this is something that Mill Jackson does quite a lot. It's similar to what happened in the eighth measure of his solo when he played this phrase. Again, it's the flat nine sus sound. So that to me is one of the great things about this solo. Okay, so we've broken apart the solo, we've played it slowly, and what you should do is try to learn it verbatim. Try to just learn the entire solo and play it. And now what I'm gonna do is show you some exercises that I've used to try and mix my improvisation with these riffs in an attempt to incorporate these riffs and essentially steal them for myself. So the very first thing I'm gonna do is actually just play on the first four bars only. This is the A minor seven flat five, D seven flat nine, G7. The first thing I'm going to do is play the first two measures exactly as Milt played them, and then the G7 chord, I'm going to allow myself some freedom. So I'll do that four times, and then I'm going to flip it around and play whatever I want on the A minor 7 flat 5, D7 flat 9, 
and play Milt's line on the G7. So hopefully there will be some good variations from this. Here we go. One, two, one, two, three, four. thing I'm going to do is take a look at this C7 sharp 11 line that Milt played and I'm going to mix it in with some other free improvisation on the C Lydian dominant scale. So here we go. One, a two, a one, two, three, four. four-measure-long 2-5-1, so one bar of C minor 7, one bar of F7, one bar of B, two bars of B-flat major 7, and I'm going to use Milt's line that he plays in measures 7 and 8 of his solo. And then I'm going to start messing around with the shape, especially on the F7 when Milt plays this shape. I'm going to start, I'm going to try flipping that upside down or maybe extending it up higher or using some different directions on that. I'm not sure what I'll do, but I'm going to try to improvise using that. So here we go. One, two, one, two, three, four. stuff, the double time runs. So people often ask me, how do you get these double time runs to come out naturally? And the answer is you have to break them into very small chunks and work them into your playing by doing something like the following. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take the very first two beats on that B flat major. I'm going to play a two measure phrase. And on the first two beats of measure one, I'm going to play that line. And the rest of the phrase, I'm just going to play eighth notes from a B-flat pentatonic scale going in whatever direction I feel like. So here's what that would sound like. One, two, one, two, three, four. it's always going to start with the, stain, the same stick. So in this case, I was doing it right-handed. So it's very important to also practice it left-handed. Two, three, four. <laughs> So now 
I'm going to work my way through all of the parts of this two measure long phrase and try to play them at the correct position in each bar. So now let's take a look at this G7. The line for the G7 is this. And of course I'm going to continue till the downbeat of the second bar. So now I'm going to do what I did before, but now on beats three and four I'm going to play that line. So here we go. One, two, three, four. So now we've been doing it using what I call the filler is a pentatonic scale on eighth notes. Now we're going to use a pentatonic scale playing sixteenth notes and still try to fill it in. This is a lot more difficult but it's a really great way to practice this stuff and the whole point of this exercise is for you to have something that you can have your hands play without you thinking about it and that's the role of the B flat pentatonic mindless sixteenth notes. If you need to just do sixteenths in one position that's perfectly fine and then you sort of flip a switch and play the riff and then you turn the switch off and you go back to playing the pentatonic without thinking about what you're doing. You just let your hands go and they should, hit. if you've practiced it enough, you will hit some good notes. So this is how you incorporate these riffs into your playing. Here we go. One, two, three, four. seven. minor seven. One, two, three, four. Now I'll do it with the F7. One, two, three, four. Thank you. 